Position the patient supine in the bed, with the head slightly elevated. If a large volume paracentesis is anticipated, start an intravenous line and place the patient on a monitor. Several different anatomic approaches may be utilized for abdominal paracentesis. A point 2 cm below the umbilicus may be chosen and offers the advantage of needle entry through the tendinous avascular linea alba. Alternatively, either a right or left lower quadrant approach may be used at a point 4 to 5 cm superior and medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. If a right or left lower quadrant approach is used, the needle must enter lateral to the rectus sheath in order to avoid injuring the inferior epigastric arteries. Additionally, you must carefully assess for hepato or splenomegaly prior to the procedure. If available, use bedside ultrasound to confirm that the needle entry site is overlying fluid and is free of intra-abdominal structures. Note that acidic fluid is anechoic and appears black on ultrasound. Note also the skin, the kidney, and the lack of any anatomic impediments to paracentesis at this site. Once a suitable location is identified, mark the entry site with a skin marking pen. Next, put on sterile gloves and begin to prepare the entry site with either chlorhexidine or povidone iodine. Use gradually increasing concentric circles during antiseptic application and apply a sterile fenestrated drape once you are finished. Using a 25 gauge needle, place a wheel of 1% lidocaine in the superficial tissues overlying the entry site. Switch to a 2 inch 22 gauge needle and begin to anesthetize the deeper tissues along the anticipated course of the paracentesis catheter. Alternately, inject anesthetic and pull back on the plunger during needle advancement. Entry into the peritoneal cavity is signaled by aspiration of acidic fluid into the syringe. Inject additional anesthesia at this time to numb the highly sensitive parietal peritoneum. Prepare the paracentesis catheter assembly by attaching a 10 milliliter syringe to the back of the assembly. If a paracentesis catheter is not available, the procedure may be performed with an intravenous catheter in an analogous fashion as described below. Use an 11 blade scalpel or a 16 gauge needle to place a small nick in the skin, which will allow for easy passage of the catheter assembly through the epidermis. Hold the back end of the catheter assembly in your dominant hand Rest the dorsal surface of your non-dominant hand on the patient's skin and use the thumb and index finger of this hand to steady the shaft of the needle. Insert the needle into the skin nick and carefully advance the catheter assembly. Intermittently pull back on the plunger as you advance. Entry into the peritoneal cavity will be heralded by aspiration of acidic fluid. Immediately stop advancing the catheter assembly once fluid enters the syringe. Further advancement of the needle at this point increases the risk for intra-abdominal organ injury. While keeping the needle stationary, gently advance the catheter over the needle and into the abdomen. Then, remove the needle from the catheter. Attach a large syringe to the paracentesis catheter and withdraw 30 to 60 milliliters of fluid for diagnostic analysis. Once fluid collection is complete, detach the syringe. If additional fluid needs to be removed for therapeutic purposes, attach high pressure drainage tubing to the catheter and then insert the other end of the tubing into an evacuated container. The vacuum in the container will actively drain the acidic fluid. It will take several minutes for each bottle to fill. Enlist the help of an assistant to change bottles during the drainage procedure. During large volume paracentesis, it is essential to closely monitor the patient for hemodynamic changes, since fluid shifts may cause hypotension. The patient depicted in this video had refractory ascites due to cryptogenic cirrhosis and required palliative drainage of over 11 liters of fluid. The change in her appearance before and after the procedure is remarkable.
In situations where more than 5 liters of acidic fluid are removed, you should consider the administration of albumin at a dose of 5 to 10 grams per liter of fluid removed in order to prevent post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. The use of albumin is somewhat controversial and is not recommended by all authorities. For further discussion of this issue, please refer to the written portion of this chapter. Once fluid collection is complete, withdraw the catheter from the abdomen, remove the sterile drape, and wash away the cleansing agent from the skin. Finally, place a sterile occlusive dressing over the puncture site. Acidic fluid should be promptly transferred to appropriate collection tubes and submitted to the laboratory for analysis. In general, a tube without additives is submitted for albumin and protein analysis, and an EDTA tube is submitted for cell count and differential. Aerobic and anaerobic culture bottles should be inoculated at the bedside if infectious etiologies are of concern. Additional tests may be required depending on the clinical scenario, and these are discussed in further detail in the written portion of this chapter. The first step in acidic fluid analysis is determining whether the ascites is due to portal hypertension or another cause by calculating the serum ascites albumin gradient. This is done by subtracting the ascites albumin concentration from the serum concentration. Gradient values greater than 1.1 gram per deciliter indicate that the ascites is due to portal hypertension. Values lower than 1.1 indicate that the ascites is from other causes. To rule out spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, calculate the acidic fluid polymorphonuclear count by multiplying the total white cell count by the percentage of polys in the differential. Values greater than 250 cells per cubic millimeter are indicative of SBP. For additional discussion of acidic fluid analysis, please refer to the written portion of this chapter.